Good evening, you're watching Look North, our top story tonight. The RSPB says the number of birds of prey killed in areas like the Peak District is a national disgrace. Public have to be vigilant, please do report things if you see them to the RSPB and the police. You know, this has to stop, the killing has to stop. We hear from a man who witnessed an illegal bird shooting here in our region. Also tonight, a week to go until the Chancellor's budget, head teachers say a major boost to school funding should be a priority. We meet the deaf dog learning new tricks, Polo, the five-year-old crossbreed learning sign language. And raising a pint together for over half a century, the friends who've been meeting in the pub every Thursday for 56 years. And there'll be some more October sunshine to come tomorrow, but will it last as we head into the weekend? Join me for that detailed forecast. Hello there, it's Wednesday the 23rd of October. Thank you for your company tonight. We start with the RSPB calling for new legislation to stop protected birds of prey from being killed illegally. Now the charity says more than 1,300 birds from hen harriers to golden eagles have been killed in the UK over the past 15 years. The BBC has seen footage from the Peak District of a protected bird that was shot down. Now the RSPB has described the deaths as a disgrace. Our rural affairs correspondent Malcolm Pryor has the story and a warning you may find some of his reports distressing. Wow. A pair of buzzards flying high over Kent. <gasps> Birds of prey killed illegally. Rare and threatened species from hen harriers and short-eared owls to golden and white-tailed eagles are supposed to be protected by law. But according to a new RSPB report, more than 1,300 have been killed over the past 15 years. And even that is thought to be the tip of the iceberg, as so many are killed unseen in remote locations like here in the Peak District. But one rare witness to a killing has agreed to talk to me on condition of anonymity, he fears reprisals for reporting the killing to police. This is footage of the investigation team at the site where the owl was discovered. While bird watching, he saw a lone hunter shoot a short-eared owl out of the sky. I was watching it. It effectively went puff and disappeared. I instantly knew what had happened, but at that point as well, I also heard a shot come through. I was in utter, like, Shock wasn't the word, but I was, I was just disgusted about what I'd just seen. Well, the RSPB are clear. They say the majority of these killings are taking place on or near shooting estates. And they say some gamekeepers are killing these birds of prey to protect their own game birds like pheasants, partridge or grouse, and to protect the profits that they bring. Shooting game birds is big business said to bring around £3.3 billion to the UK economy every year. Its supporters insist its estate owners do much to protect the countryside and its wildlife. We have absolute zero tolerance for any form of illegal killing of, of birds of prey. Um, there is no place for, for any illegal activity. We stood up and said that before and we'll say it again. Uh, fortunately, uh, for our sector, it's a very, very small minority of people. So what more can be done? Mark Thomas is the RSPB's head of investigations. He believes it's time all the UK's devolved nations followed Scotland's example and brought in licensing for shooting estates. That means if any offences occur on a particular shoot, that shoot can lose the ability to shoot on there. The licence is revoked for a number of years. Unfortunately, we haven't got that in the rest of the UK. This has to stop. The killing has to stop. The administrations of England, Wales and Northern Ireland told the BBC that there are strong penalties in place for crimes committed against birds of prey, but currently there are no plans to licence shooting estates. In the meantime, bird watchers and countryside walkers have been put on high alert to report any incidents they see, in the hope that these rare birds may be given a chance not only to survive, but to thrive once more across the UK. Malcolm Pryor, BBC Look North, the Peak District. 
Next night, a pregnant mother from Leeds who died yesterday morning after falling from a tower block has been named locally as Emma Atkinson. West Yorkshire Police said that the baby was delivered at hospital shortly after the incident and was receiving critical care. Beth Parsons has been at the scene in Leeds. Tributes have been left here at Shakespeare Tower yesterday and throughout today in memory of Leeds mum Emma Atkinson. The words left amongst the flowers and words left online describe Emma as bubbly, one of a kind and a beautiful soul gone too soon. It follows the news from West Yorkshire Police yesterday afternoon who said at 10.24 yesterday morning they were called by an ambulance service who said a woman in her 30s fell from a height. We understand that CPR was attempted but she died of her injuries here at the scene. West Yorkshire Police say there are no suspicious circumstances and the coroner's office was informed. Now we understand that Emma was seven months pregnant at the time and despite having no official updates from police and the hospital today. Yesterday they said the baby was in hospital and undergoing critical care. We do understand that it was a baby girl. Beth Parsons, BBC Look North, Leeds. We'll keep you up to date with that very sad story. You're watching Wednesday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. We find out why memorial plaques for loved ones have been removed from an iconic Yorkshire bridge. But before that, let's bring you up to date with some more stories that are coming into our newsroom. Two men have been arrested after a teenager was shot and stabbed in Leeds. The 16-year-old boy was attacked by a group of men in Cambrian Terrace in Holbeck 10 days ago. A 22-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder and possession of a firearm. A 46-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. After being released from hospital, the victim was also arrested on suspicion of possession of an offensive weapon. A 16-year-old boy has been charged after a fire broke out on a bus in the centre of Bradford. Social media footage showed smoke billowing out from a double-decker bus in Broadway in October last year. The boy, who can't be named for legal reasons, has been bailed and will appear before Bradford Magistrates Court in November charged with arson. No one was injured during the incident. Sheffield Steel is going to be used in a landmark defence deal announced between the UK and Germany. Now in the deal, Sheffield Forge Masters will provide the steel used in manufacturing artillery gun barrels at a brand new factory. The first gun barrels are expected to be produced in 2027 and support 400 jobs. The Defence Secretary and Royal Marsh and Conisborough MP John Healy this morning signed the Treaty House Agreement with his German counterpart gun barrels built in Britain with British steel for our British armed forces and for our allies. It's a week until Leeds MP and Chancellor Rachel Reeves delivers Labour's first budget since the election in July. Now you might remember in their manifesto they promised they wouldn't increase taxes on working people, promising not to raise VAT, income tax or national insurance and saying they'll invest in public services like the NHS and education. Well, Gemma Dillon is here to tell us what it could mean for people living in our area. It's going to be a big day, isn't it, next week? Absolutely, Amy. It will be a really historic budget for Leeds MP Rachel Reeves. Not only is it Labour's first budget in 14 years, but it is the first time we've had a female Chancellor. Now, there's been lots of speculation about what might be in it. Labour claim they've inherited a £22 billion black hole from the Conservatives, and that's likely to affect all of us. I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago, and she was clear about the challenges. We will begin to take the first steps uh, to ensure that our public services function uh, properly, starting with our National Health Service, with our commitment of 40,000 additional appointments every single week in the National Health Service. On local government, we've committed to longer term settlements so that local authorities, council leaders can plan better for the future and know what resource is going to be available. One of the areas we know has faced a lot of pressure is the education budget. Many schools are struggling. Abby Jayola has been talking to one school in Calderdale. Light. Light. These year one pupils are learning how to write and read, while teachers are trying to balance the books. One of the financial pressures is dealing with the changing pupil intake. Since Covid, 
I think nationally a lot of, lot of heads would report that we've had more medical need, more um, special educational needs coming through into schools and, and with those because we, we're all determined to be inclusive that inclusivity comes at a price and we need to put support in so that's putting massive pressures I think on lots of people's budgets at the moment. These two acro crops are here just for safety. Castle Hill Primary is shortly due to be rebuilt, but past uncertainty about the future has meant a drop in pupil numbers, putting further stress on their funding. Despite having to work in less than ideal conditions, they've recently been rated good by Ofsted. The biggest challenge for the head is trying to make his budget stretch. You would think a caretaker or a site manager in school was something that everybody could afford, but many schools can't now. Um, do we have enough teaching assistance? Can we afford to subsidise trips that we might once have done? No. And so as budget shrinks, we get more and more focused on our core purposes. And we're finding increasingly we're having to do work that perhaps would have been done by outside agencies before because that support network we've had in the past is shrinking as well. So we're doing more with less. A survey of head teachers in Calderdale, organised by a campaign group, paints a bleak picture. Nearly all of those who responded are worried about their budgets. They want the Chancellor to find more money for schools. Well, basically, uh, it's dire. I think what needs to be had is that there is substantial funding invested in our schools because we're talking about the next generation of children that are growing up without, the, uh, without a proper future. Substantial money needs to be invested in our schools. The Department for Education say they've increased school funding to £61.8 this year and recognise the challenges schools are facing. Next year's budget has yet to be agreed, but teachers say more needs to be done to protect the future for pupils. Abby Jayola, BBC Look North, Todmorden. So will our schools get more money? Well, one of the more controversial things the government has been clear they want to do is introduce VAT on private school fees to pay for 6,500 new teachers in England. It's due to come in in January next year. On to winter fuel. This is one of the first things the Chancellor announced, scrapping winter fuel payments for pensioners unless they're claiming pension credit or other means-tested help. The plans have been widely criticised, with many urging a rethink. I got it last year, the fuel payment, but that's no guarantee you're going to get it again. No, so. I shall just have to keep it on and then probably be in debt to the mm. gas or electric. I can't stand uh, to be cold or freezing, so if I have to pay for it, yeah, I'll probably find it hard. It's not going to be cold because it affects your body then. It makes you feel ill. Let's have a look at transport. One of the things there's been a lot of speculation around is fuel duty. It hasn't risen in over a decade. And following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when prices surged, the Conservative government cut it by five pence a litre. Now there's speculation it could rise, hitting all motorists who haven't converted to electric yet. And finally, let's have a look at levelling up. It was a key mission of the last Conservative government and a lot of places across Yorkshire have been promised some of this levelling up cash to help regenerate the area. Since the Labour government came in, many of these projects have been put under review. So this money was uh, allocated to a robotic centre, to the Keeplingworth Valley Railway, uh, to making sure that we're making town centre improvements, to revitalise uh, Keefley. And that's why I campaigned so hard to make sure that we were successful in getting this additional £40 million uh, for Keefley. And of course, this is at risk now as we go into the budget. Of course, this is still speculation and we won't know for sure until the budget next week. Amy. Gemma. A West Yorkshire man has branded a council heartless after it removed a plaque dedicated to his parents' memory from a bridge in a remote beauty spot. Now, the little brass plaque near Reith in the Yorkshire Dales was one of several which were unscrewed from the bottom of the footbridge, made famous by the original TV series All Creatures Great and Small. Olivia Richwald takes up the story. As a small boy in the 1980s, Peter Lethley remembers his mum and dad scouring the countryside to find the bridge and ford made famous by the title sequence of All Creatures Great and Small. 
It is in the Dales near Reith, and once identified, this remote spot became his family's favourite destination. And this was my mother's truly, truly special place. We used to build dams across this stream. My mother used to sit on the hill with an old gramophone that she'd found, a wind-up gramophone, and used to be playing the music while we played down here in the streams. Peter's mother died 10 years ago and his father almost two years ago. On Christmas Eve last year, Peter returned to the bridge with a special plaque. The plaque was small, it wasn't very big, it wasn't obtrusive, it was a very standard brass plaque, um, which was placed along with many others on the bridge at the same time. But the next time he returned to lay yellow roses in memory of his parents, all of the plaques had been removed. And it was just here, it wasn't obtrusive, it wasn't causing any problems. And you can see that none of this has been repaired anyway. So there's absolutely no reason for them to take them off. It just doesn't make any sense. They may as well have just thrown them in the stream because it was so heartless. It was so disrespectful to everybody's feelings. And this is such a memorable place that they've literally ripped the heart out of it. North Yorkshire Council said it understood families wanted to do something to remember their loved ones. A spokesman added, we had to remove several plaques on the bridge during routine maintenance and we returned them to the families where possible, explaining why they couldn't remain in place. As a general rule, plaques are a concern as they have the potential of covering defects, which we need to be aware of to keep the public safe, and their fixings can cause the timber behind to decay. There weren't hundreds of padlocks on the bridge as you see in other places. Your heart stops when you see that the plaques have all gone and when you look closely you realise that there's no reason for them to have been removed anyway. One of the plaques has since been replaced. While the council has urged families affected to get in touch, Peter feels that the magical place of his childhood is now tainted and the upset he feels is very deep. Olivia Richwald, BBC Look North, in the Yorkshire Dales. Let's bring you some sports news now. In football in particular, it was a bit disappointing overall, I'm afraid. Our eight EFL teams in action produced just one single win between them for Leeds United. Here's Paul Ogden with the highlights or lowlights. It was as if Ellen Road's euphoria from last Friday night's win over Sheffield United hadn't gone away. Against Watford, Leeds picked up after the weekend pause with two more goals inside eight minutes last night to set up a 2-1 win. Laji Ramazani, followed quickly by Brendan Aronson. Both goals unintentionally assisted by the Watford goalie, Bachman. Watford threatened briefly after their early second-half goal, but second-place leads are now level on points with Championship leader Sunderland, who, like Sheffield United, by the way, play tonight. Sheffield Wednesday failed to score at home again, this time against Swansea, but at least they kept their opponents out as well in a nil-nil draw. Paul Valentin came closest with this shot. The same scoreless draw in League One for Huddersfield at Wrexham, but there was no shortage of goals or entertainment for Barnsley fans. Still, their 2-2 draw with Charlton reminded us that Barnsley have one of the leakiest defences as well as one of the liveliest attacks in the division's top half. Davis Keeler Dunn's opener nearly ended up counting for nothing when Charlton took a 2-1 lead in injury time but Max Waters hit straight back in the 95th minute to secure a point for the Reds. Rotherham United, Doncaster Rovers and Harrogate Town all lost by a goal to nil, but Chesterfield created enough for more than their 1-1 draw with Colchester, Will Griggs equaliser securing a point. Bradford City a fifth, but had to settle for the same at Cheltenham after taking an early lead through Neil Byrne. Paul Ogden, BBC Look North. And in case you missed the big Super League news today, well done to Wakefield Trinity. The Championship Grand Final winners from last weekend have learned that they will be granted a place in the next season's Super League. Along with Castleford Tigers and Leeds, Wakefield have been awarded so-called Grade A status as part of the new structure next season. Huddersfield Giants were amongst those with the highest B gradings and will also form part of the 12-team Super League in 2025. We had everything sort of coming together at the right time, you know, with new stand and, and, and myself coming in with, with investment to come in. And uh, I did think we'd get grade A, but, you know, I mean, that, that's just uh, icing on cake because it's, it's a year today since I took the club. So that is an icing on cake, but I was, I was confident we were going to get in top 12. Never in doubt. 
take a look at Polo. She's gorgeous, isn't she? She's deaf. She was found in Bradford last April, chained in a yard with the tips of her ears missing after they were cropped in a process which is illegal in England and Wales. So now Polo is learning sign language, something the RSPCA hopes will help her land her forever family, as Isabel Fry reports. Polo's not your average five-year-old crossbreed. She may love to play <laughs> and eat treats, but she's also learning sign language. Find it. We need someone who is just going to celebrate Polo for being Polo because she is big, she is deaf, uh, but she's also, you know, there's so much more to her than just that. She's, she's goofy, she's, she's friendly, she, uh, she loves to do things, she loves training. So we just need someone who is going to take her for what she is. She was rescued by the RSPCA after being found abandoned in Bradford. She was emaciated, so she was very thin. She'd been outside. She had a prolapse, which needed she needed to see the vet like urgently. So she wasn't in like a very good state, um, which is a real shame because obviously from her personality, you can tell that she was like um, really cared for at one point. When did you, as a team, decide to start teaching Polo sign language? With all the dogs, you know, we try and do training with them, just, you know, teach them to sit and lie down and just bits that it's just interesting for them. You know, they really engage with it, it's something to do when they come out of the kennel. Um, so obviously for Polo, trying to teach her things like this, um, we just had to use a different way. This isn't sign language you may see people doing. This is sit. The team have been teaching Polo different hand gestures over the past year, including sit, lie down and many others. The RSPCA is facing a rehoming crisis. Just last year, they saw 42% more dogs come in than were being rehomed by the charity. And it's dogs like Polo who are struggling to get adopted, but hoping these new communication skills she's learnt will lead to her finding her forever home. It just seems to be taking longer and longer, so obviously that means that then there's more dogs waiting. So it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it, it's difficult. Go for it. Clever girl Polo is, and who knows, her forever family could be watching Look North right now. Finally tonight, a story of true, long-lasting friendship. The group of mates from South Yorkshire have met up at the pub once a week for 56 years. That's dedication, isn't it? Now in their 80s, the five friends say they've only missed about two dozen dates in over half a century. Joe Winwood has been to meet them. <laughs> when you've been mates for 56 years, the subject of conversation can change. It, it started with uh, soccer and sex and it's finished up with pensions and prostate. <laughs> Meet Ken, Dick, Paul, Brian, Bill and Pete. For more than half a century, they've been meeting for a pint every Thursday, usually here at the White Swan in Sheffield, and have barely missed a week. Every, every Thursday, I, I look forward to coming. I know that we're gonna, I'm going to come in we're going to have arguments, but we'll laugh all the time. And I'm, oh, we have a drink, of course. If, oh, don't, don't forget the beer, that's an important part. You know you're going to be talking to friends who you can talk about any subject in the world. And that's, that's important. They even kept it going during COVID, although to keep things flowing, Pete produced an order sheet. Should the country be secular? Do you agree with assisted dying? All things like this, you know, do you still use uh, cloth handkerchiefs? Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, There's a fair, fair variation of subjects. All, all sorts of things. Uh, what's your biggest regret? There can on occasion be a row. We all know who thinks in opposition to us. We know who they are and we play on it a little bit. We can fiercely argue about things such as Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> now at this point, Paul and Brian proceeded to argue about the status of a hypothetical cat in a box for about five minutes, with only one conclusion. It's, it's, this is what's happening now, is why we do it. We're laughing. It's like a camaraderie, isn't it, really? We, we just, we stick together like glue, don't we? In addition, I know when I leave the pub, there'll be a smile on my face from the night we've had. And that is the mark of a friendship that lasts. Joe Inwood, BBC Look North, at the White Swan in Sheffield.
<laughs> oh, isn't that lovely? What a brilliant piece. Keep it up, men. Uh, although, if my husband's watching, do not get any ideas. There's no way you get away with going to the pub every week. I know, you'd stop that off, wouldn't you? Of course I would. Hey, I bet they've seen a change in beer prices in 50 years. <laughs> I'm sure anyway, they have. Anyway, let's uh, have a look at a couple of pictures because it's been absolutely stunning today. Uh, we saw some mist and low cloud. Uh, the sunshine came through eventually, but this was taken in Rydale just as the mist was beginning to lift. And this was first thing in the morning at Ferry Bridge. Uh, you can see some uh, mistiness there, but the sun was about to come through the clouds. And it's a repeat performance tomorrow, actually. If you've got any pictures you'd like to send to me, then uh, the addresses are on your screen right now. So tomorrow does look a nice day, but we'll have to contend with that mist, patchy low cloud and fog at first but it won't hang along for too long and then we'll see some really nice spells of sunshine and above average temperatures yet again some spots knocking on the door of 16 degrees now it's a really complicated setup on friday a lot of clouds and fog at first this week front might bring some patchy light rain later in the day but then it basically gives up the ghost and for the weekend, even though it does look pretty complicated, on the whole, it's not looking too bad. A good deal of fine and dry weather, some sunny spells. And then apart from some drizzle on Monday, next week is looking pretty good, of course. It's half term. Now, there's the satellite pitch. You can see there's still some cloud around, and that cloud will come and go through the course of this evening. But it's fairly quiet conditions, dry with variable cloud. There'll be sufficient breaks in the cloud to produce, help produce some mist, fog, and low cloud, not too much of it. Uh, usual suspects, maybe Vale York and the Trent Valley, and we'll see lowest temperatures coming in at around seven or eight degrees Celsius. So tomorrow's high water times, Scarborough at 10.15, Bridlington at 10.33. So if it starts grey where you are, shouldn't last too long. It'll clear through the morning elsewhere. Eastern areas off to a glory start with some sunshine. And then all parts will see variable cloud. There will be amounts of cloud around, but also some decent spells of sunshine. The breeze picking up, you'll notice that along the coast, but temperatures will rise to above average levels. We're, we should be around 13 at this time of the year, 15, maybe 16, somewhere eastern parts of South Yorkshire, Finningley, Bawtry, that part of the world. Now, the further outlook, it's a little bit, uh, a lot of uncertainty, but Friday at the moment looks overcast, some mist and fog lifting into low cloud, bit of drizzle and light rain, especially over the hills. And then Saturday and Sunday, not too bad, dry with some sunshine. Monday, a little bit iffy, but if you're looking forward to half term at the moment, it's looking surprisingly good. That's the forecast. Husband's just the text. He says he's going to the pub with his mates. So I wonder where he got that idea <laughs> yeah, from. I, I think you'll have something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is it from us, but we'll, of course, be back with the late news. Bye-bye for now. Have you been?